Hi everyone, it's Rachel. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's masterclass, which is a beautiful fall garden style design. I'm thrilled to be teaching you. We've got a bucket full of the most beautiful flowers that we're working with. Um, and it's gonna be an all around great seasonal class. Um, we're gonna design a little bit more in a gardeny style. So lots of beautiful layered blooms, lots of really gorgeous premium greenery. Um, so why don't we go ahead and dive in. Um, this of course is the pre-recorded version of workshop, so it's not the live class. You can push pause and start as many times as you would like. So if you feel like you've missed something or you want to re-watch a portion, you're welcome to do so. Um, we do respond to comments and messages, so if you have questions along the way, feel free to ping us and we can get right back to you. Um, couple of little housekeeping things for workshops. So everyone should have a beautiful birch vase. Um, birch vases come one of two ways. So you'll either find birch vases that have a plastic liner in them or birch vases that have glass liners in them. This has a glass liner, which means that it's a lot sturdier and it can be reused time and time again. Um, so this is definitely one to save for your vase collection. Um, everyone should also have chicken wire. It's hard to see it against the white wall, but um, chicken wire, ours is about uh, the size of a sheet of printer paper, so about eight and a half by 11 is the size. Um, you'll also have an ingredient list for class, so if you want to follow along with the uh, variety types, they're right here. Um, and then of course your bucket of flowers. This class has a lot of flowers, so just be delicate as you go to pull your blooms out, especially with your dahlias and your celosia and some of the more fragile stems. Um, and so uh, without further ado, we'll dive into the design. Um, everyone needs to fill their vase with uh, floral water um, or just regular water. Room temperature water is about what you want to use. Um, if you want to pre-treat your water, you can add a dash of sugar, which is a carbohydrate that the flowers will eat. Um, they're always happier when they've got a little bit of food in the water. Um, and we're going to roll our chicken wire into a ball. Doesn't need to be pretty. This is one of those things that you'll never see again after you add your flowers. Um, so just crumple it into some type of sphere. And we're just going to tuck that down into the vase. Um, we always get a couple of questions. Is it okay if the chicken wire sits slightly above the vase line? Yes, it's totally fine. So you can see that mine is popping up an inch or two over the top of the vase. No problem. Um, the next thing you'll want is some type of cutting tool um, for class as we actually handle our flowers. Um, I will talk you through my two tools. I'm just gonna come closer to the camera to kind of show you uh, my very dirty, well-loved tools. Um, I always design with a pair of clippers. My preferred brand is ARS, um, which is a Japanese clipper. And these, even though it's like a seven inch pruning shear, are so powerful you could almost cut down like a thick tree branch with them. So I highly recommend, um, if you go into our link on our Instagram, it'll take you to our Amazon store and you can find this exact model. Um, and then I also design, I interchange uh, with a Swiss Army knife. So this is just a foldable, Swiss Army knife, um, and this gives you the cleanest, longest angled cut on your stem. Um, so that's what I recommend. You can also, of course, use any number of tools, um, the floral scissors, the Joyce Chen's, a lot of people like, um, anything really that is not a home pair of scissors is good. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and dive in. Um, for class tonight, we're going to start um, with our kale as our first ingredient. These are just so massive. They're kind of taking the place of a hydrangea in this arrangement. Um, so we're going to pop them in first and then we're going to put our greenery around it. Uh, the reason we do that, the reason we add either hydrangea or kale before greenery is that it takes up such a massive amount of real estate in your arrangement that you don't want to like plop these on top of your beautiful focal greenery. Um, you want to instead allow your greenery to trail over top and around them. Um, so anytime I handle kale, some of the stems are just huge and unmanageable. So I like to peel away the bottom leaves. And you can just do that with your hand. Um, and I just leave the tippy top. 
So if I do that with all of these, any leaves that look bad or damaged, I'm just gonna peel right off. And then the next phase of conditioning my kale is I'm gonna flare out the remaining leaves. So I'm just gonna peel them back so that they open into a beautiful rosette. So you really only wanna allow the top portion of the kale to remain because it flares out to be so big. If you left all of those low line leaves, it would be just way too bulky to get into your design. All right, so we're of course using a white and green variegated kale. This is a frilly variety, which I think is insanely beautiful. Uh, it's coming in from Holland and it's not cheap, but it's really beautiful. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and cut our stems at a nice angle. And if you've taken class with me before, you know that I always talk about the base height in relation to how long your stem should be. So this is a five and a half inch base. So we're gonna cut our stems to about five and a half, six inches in length, and we're gonna just crisscross them down to the opposite corner of the base. And you wanna make sure that your stem is landing at the bottom of the base where the water is. So I'm just gonna cut again. This is a really thick stem. I have two kale stems that are a little bit thinner. This one is thicker than my thumb. So you can always just shear off carefully um, some of the width of the stem to make it a little bit thinner and easier to manipulate. So that's a little trick that I do all the time. So I'm just gonna come now from the other side. These kale stems are by far the thickest stems that we're using today, so it's not uncommon that you'll have to really um, kind of wiggle them into the chicken wire. It's like a blessing and a curse. The chicken wire gives us a great armature, but anytime you're designing with a thicker stem, it's a real pain in the butt. Um, and I'm making sure to not um, leave this too compact, so I'm letting the stems hang out a tiny bit to breathe. And I'm gonna add my third one um, on the back side. So I've got my three kind of evenly spaced, kind of like a triangle in my design. Um, I'll show you some different angles, like so. All right, so now that I have these guys placed, I'm actually gonna come in and trace out the shape of my design with beautiful greenery. Um, and we have really gorgeous greens in class tonight. So I'm just gonna dive into my bucket and pull out the different stems that we're gonna goop around with. So we've got, this is a beautiful Lakutho coming in from Holland. Does grow locally, so you may recognize it from your garden. Um, also have some Cotinus, which is a beautiful plum color. This is also called smoke bush, so Cotinus or smoke bush. We've got some really fancy eucalyptus. Okay, so this is, uh, Eucalyptus cinerea, which is coming in from Holland. Okay, really gorgeous. So I'm just making a little pile or stack for myself of what I've got to play around with. We really do have a ton of greenery. Okay. So anytime I am greening a vase, I'm going to think about what greenery I care about the most and what greenery I care about the least. Um, the greenery that I care about the least is what I'm gonna start with because it's gonna get buried a little bit more. Um, so I really care the least about my smoke bush. It's great for laying cover in your arrangement um, and it's gonna give us some pretty dimension but it's definitely not as splashy and showy as my Lakutho, which to remind everyone, this is Lakutho. Um, so I'm gonna start with my Cotinus first, then I'll move on to Eucalyptus, and last I'm just gonna pop in that Lakutho, which is gonna give us a really beautiful drapey feel. Um, so I'm gonna take my Cotinus and I'm gonna fill in in between all of my kale, and I'm just stripping away all of my low-lying leaves. So I'm just leaving a tiny bit on top, kind of like a little tree. I've got a naked stem that goes into the base because we don't want leaves floating around in our water. And I'm just gonna work, work, work. 
We're going to be building more in a, of an oblong shaped design tonight. So um, it doesn't need to be a perfectly round design. You can definitely allow a little bit of extra spill off to the sides. So think of your design kind of like a football. I'm also going to make sure that I pop one piece at least of cortinas right up and down in the center of my design. Now the reason why that's important is we're always thinking in terms of blending our greens. So you want to make sure that you never wind up with an arrangement that has like a very pronounced collar of one type of greenery that's low in the arrangement and no other greenery mixed into the top. Um, so really being mindful to spread the wealth, so to speak. So now that I've got my cotinas placed and my arrangement is starting to fill in, I'm kind of seeing the shape, I'm gonna take my beautiful Cineria eucalyptus and I'm going to um, pop that in. So I mentioned before that this eucalyptus is coming out of Holland. It is um, bougie eucalyptus. So it's a little bit fancier. It almost has the roundness and shape of a uh, leaf as a silver dollar eucalyptus, but has the spiral or true blue upright stem. Um, and it's really gorgeous for wedding work. We're buying a lot of it right now for our brides, especially this time of year, we're really in the height of eucalyptus season. Um, so for weddings, we tend to use a lot more of the bright burgundy greens, for summer and then when fall rolls around, everybody wants like the deep smoke bush, they want the silvery grays, and um, it's a lot moodier once October rolls around. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just pop in my eucalyptus. And again, I'm paying attention to make sure that I'm blending some higher up in the design and some lower down. And because this is more of a gardening style of design, Definitely do not be afraid to allow your greenery to kind of explode out of your vase a little bit. You can always cut it back at the end if you feel like it looks nuts at the end, but a lot of times I find when people set out to make a garden style design, they actually don't go far enough in um, kind of blowing out the shape of their design. They're a little bit too conservative, and once you add all of the flowers in, it tends to look very compact. Um, so don't be afraid to really let your greens trail. Um, the last greenery that I'm going to play in is our beautiful Lakuto. I'm going to come around and show you guys how killer these leaves are. Um, this is a beautiful variegation on the leaf. It's got a little bit of rusty brown in it. It's got yellow, cream, green. So it's really an interesting um, type of green. And I also like how airy it is. And it's a good, when we talk about like building movement in a design, this is a great type of greenery to build a little bit of movement. Let's, let's play around, shall we? So again, I'm just stripping off the bottom leaves. I'm leaving my stem length pretty nice and long because this is the greenery above any of the others that I want to really spill and trail out. So see, I'm just extending the line of my arrangement. And I'm gonna do that in both directions because again, we're building something that's a little bit more oblong. Oblong is a shape that did not exist in the floral world, um, you know, with the exception of a long and low container. It was not a popular design shape uh, until the last couple of years, and we do a lot of designs um, for long tables now. All the brides want long tables, um, so it's not uncommon at all for us to take a square vase or a cylinder vase and just elongate it and make that pretty football shape. Um, all right, so I've got everything traced out. I'm going to step aside because I think it's easier for you guys to kind of see the shape of it up against the white wall. Um, so we've really elongated this end and this end, and we've mapped out the overall shape of our design. So anytime you're arranging, I would encourage you to start in this order. Always get your, your big bulk blooms in first, so whether that's hydrangea, or for us, we're doing kale tonight, um, and then place your greenery in after because the greenery kind of traces out the footprint. And I find once you get to this stage, it's a lot easier to kind of picture in your head what the next several steps look like. So this is a great foundation for our design. So uh, we're going to continue playing with our beautiful fall flowers. Um, I'm going to start with uh, placing some amaranth and chocolate flocks next. Um, 
Amaranth is a flower you can grow locally in your backyard. It does well in this climate. Um, this is our favorite amaranth. It's called a copper biscuit, and it's a beautiful kind of sienna -y orange uh, color. And it has more of an upright shape than the draping amaranthus, but it still has some movement to it. Um, and then we also have chocolate phlox, which is coming in from Holland. And this is like a great texture piece for fall. Um, I don't know that it's a flower that I would necessarily like pick out and buy if I were just buying a one-off flower. It's not like a beautiful focal garden rose or peony, um, but it is killer for texture. And you can tell, like looking at the design, there is actually a thought to connecting and bridging the gap. So this chocolate phlox is a great alternate texture to this potina, so the smoke bush, that's also that really pretty plum color. Um, and then the amaranthus picks up a little bit of the rusty color in the ligustrum foliage. So when we build our arrangements, we're kind of placing like little stepping stones that connect all of the colors within the palette. Um, and that works really well. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to insert our copper amaranthus. And this is a draping element. So wherever you place it, you want to make sure that it kind of spills out of the arrangement. I've got one piece hanging right down here. I think I'm going to make these guys friends and they're going to sit next to each other in the design, just like that. And I'll put the other one off to the other side, the other back corner, just like that. All right, so with our chocolate phlox, I think we're gonna have a chocolate phlox moment in our arrangement. So what that means is I'm gonna put all three pieces angled in one direction together. So I always love to group certain elements just for bigger impact. So I'm gonna bring some chocolate phlox in down on the front of my design. And then I'm gonna do the other two pieces neighboring off to the side. So don't be afraid to group and put some light flowers together sometimes. It can create beautiful impact off to one side. And I know it's tricky. I'm gonna just move the camera for a second because the smoke bush and the phlox on camera kind of blend, but we've got our three pieces of phlox kind of shooting off to the side. Um, and it just gives us a bit more presence in the design to do it that way. There we go. Okay, I think we're back in action. All right. So next up, we're going to add in a beautiful velvety coxcomb. Coxcomb is definitely a fall staple. It's highly seasonal. This is not something that you can really buy out of season um, very easily. Holland does produce off-season coxcomb, but usually it's in a bizarre color and uh, it's very expensive. So this is locally grown, uh, coming in from Amish country, and it looks like a cumin brain, which is why it's called the brain flower. Um, another awesome texture flower. It is velvety to the touch, which is super cool. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and peel back these leaves, like so. All right, great. And I'm just going to pop my brain flower in. Um, I love to put brain flower in lower in the design. I find that it sits really beautifully low down in an arrangement, but it looks a little bit weird if you put it high up. Um, so we're just going to put this right along the rim of the vase, and it'll perch right there. I'll come around and do that. Just like that, so it's staying nice and low. And with this design, because it's a little bit more gardeny in style, don't be afraid to recess certain things. So I've kind of recessed that celosia deeper down, and I have greens coming out uh, all around it. All right, so the next thing that I'm going to pop in, we have gorgeous shimmer roses tonight. Um, so I'm just going to condition my roses. And when I condition roses, I'll talk to you about what that means. Um, all of the leaves come off of the stem. These do not have thorns, which is a huge plus. And then I'm going to take off the guard petals on the outside of the rose. So let me show you what that looks like. So every single rose, no matter the variety, will have guard petals. And for the purposes of keeping it real in workshop, we leave the guard petals on. So we would never send, if you ordered happy birthday flowers, for example, 
we would never send you roses with guard petals still intact in an actual arrangement, but we want you all to have the florist experience. So these guard petals need to come off. And when we handle roses, we only wanna handle the petals from the side of the rose. We never wanna to touch the face of a rose because it'll bruise. So I'm just gonna peel from the side and I'm gonna take off just a few guard petals until I feel like I've got a really nice clean rose underneath. Um, every rose is different. So there is no rule for how many guard petals need to come off. You're just removing the ones that look weathered, worn, or damaged. Um, and once that's been done, you are going to uh, have the option, if you wanna open your rose a little bit more, you can actually blow on it. And it'll start to relax and open your rose a bit more. Um, you don't have to do that, but when we're arranging, oftentimes we're just puffing on them a little bit so they are not so over tight. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and condition all of these roses. Um, and again, this is a shimmer rose, this peach color. It's a gorgeous peach, it's reliable, it performs well, and it has a really nice long base life. And for fall, in our studio at least, we like to not be so literal with what fall looks like. So oftentimes we'll reach for pastel peachy roses or we'll do plum roses um, rather than just the traditional kind of boring combination of orange and brown. Um, so we like to mix it up a little bit. So just gonna condition these. Do, 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 do. Another little hack, a neat hack, if you're ever looking to get your roses opened more quickly, roses are super, super sensitive to temperature. Not all flowers are, but roses in particular, if you cut the stems and stick them in a vase with really warm water, they'll open more quickly. Um, and another hack that I love is to create a little sauna for your roses. So if you're ever in a crisis point where you need to get flowers open pronto, um, you can put your flowers in a room with a shower running, or you could um, put your flowers in a bucket with really hot water and then tape a trash bag over the top of it. Um, it sounds ridiculous, but I think every single florist in America has been there where we need to get flowers open quickly for a wedding, um, and those are great tricks. So with our roses, we're gonna go ahead and place these. We're gonna try to do some grouping so that we don't get a polka dotted effect all over the place. So we'll do little pockets of a few roses here and there. Um, and as we go, if we want to add a little bit of extra interest, you can definitely work to reflex out some of your petals. So if you fold out some of your outer petals on your rose, and um, that's a fun little technique to make your roses feel a little bit more special. And um, usually we do like five or six reflexed petals on a rose, nothing too crazy. Um, so you could definitely reflex out a rose or two. Um, so have fun with your placement. Um, and we're also going to be playing as we go with dimension. So we've talked about the D word, dimension, several times, but we want to make sure that we're not creating too pave of a design. So don't be afraid to let one rose hang out a little bit farther than the others. So this is where we have some fun. And again, if you wanted to reflex, you can just pop back some of the petals just like that. I definitely wouldn't do all of them. I think with reflexing, there's a limit to how many roses can get reflexed in one design. I would say like two or three roses would be really beautiful in an arrangement of this size. And I'm definitely gonna pick a front to my design. It's up to you if you wanna do that. This is gonna be my front side, my good side. Um, so I'm gonna, put my reflex roses right up front. So I've got one little pocket right there, and I'm gonna place some roses on the other side to balance it out. Maybe reflex one other one for the other side. Remember, 
we're definitely doing that oblong shape, so don't be afraid to let them really kind of poke out to the side. I think that would be really pretty and appropriate. It's about this point in your arrangement that you're going to start swearing at your chicken wire, which is totally normal. And it means that it's doing its job. It should not be easy to get your stems in at this point. So just deep, deep breaths. And breathe through it. Okay, so I've got all of my peach roses placed really nicely around my design. And I love how fancy and frilly and how much space these reflex roses are taking up. I think they look great. Um, our next ingredient is hands down my favorite find for the fall. I'm gonna walk up to the camera so you can see these. These are uh, a garden rose. They're called Dark Expression and the color is insane. I think that you could check multiple boxes for these roses. I think they could be an orange, they could be a coral, they could be red, and they could also kind of skew a little bit pink. Um, so they are really yummy. They have a high petal count, so they're gonna open to be really beautiful. Um, and as far as garden roses go, this is a cheaper garden rose. Um, most of the priciest garden roses are going to be coming in from either Japan or their David Austin garden roses. This is a South American garden rose, but let me tell you, big bang for your buck. Uh, so this, to give you an idea, wholesale cost, David Austin's will be in the $4 plus range, and this is uh, closer to two bucks a stem. So it's substantially less expensive than a full-blown English garden rose, but the color's crazy. It's a super healthy rose, um, and it blows to be really big. So you can also blow on your dark expressions. Um, and I'm going to uh, reserve two of my dark expressions to sit on the front side of my design and I'll throw one in the back. Um, and I'm just gonna play around with my dimension. So don't be afraid to, you know, recess and try it on for size. Like, does that feel good being a little bit more tucked? Um, so you can play around with your placement. So I've got one that's a little bit more buried and then why don't I tuck my other one off to the side. So I'm gonna elongate my design again. Look that beauty. Okay, cool. And I'll pop my last one in on the back side of this arrangement. If you decided that you really don't care about the back side of your arrangement looking at any sort of way, you could obviously put all of your flowers up on one side. Um, an instance in which that would be appropriate to do a one-sided design is if, for example, you know that you're going to put this arrangement up against a wall like in your front foyer area, or it will sit up against your kitchen backsplash, in which case, by all means, throw all of your fun flowers in the front, nobody will ever see the back. And that's a hack that we do all the time for our weddings, too. Um, a good example would be like altar arrangements for a church. If nobody will ever see the back except for maybe the pastor or uh, you know, a wedding photographer, then who cares? We just put all of the pretty flowers on the front side. So that's totally okay. All right, so our last flowers in the bucket fall into the category that I like to call the floaty flower category. So these are the flowers that we're going to allow to really like bounce and dance beyond uh, the weight of our arrangement. So the first flower that we'll use uh, is a dahlia. If you follow us on social media, you know that we have a love affair with our dahlia farmer, Andrea of Linvale, and that's who provided our dahlias for class today. Um, this is a ball dahlia, so it's almost fully round. Ball dahlias are a lot longer lasting than your dinner plate dahlias. Uh, and this color is also insane. It's a pinky, orangey, coral slice of magic. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and cut the stem, and I'm gonna keep these stems a little bit longer because I want these to kind of bounce out of my vase, and they're gonna sit higher up in my arrangement. So with your dahlias, it's totally fine for them to be a little bit more whimsical and fun. So I'm gonna allow one to sit out here, chicken wire is killing me at this point. 
legs. Okay. So really fun and playful placement. It's really nice and bouncy. Um, our next ingredient that we're gonna pop in is also a great floaty ingredient. It's a clematis pod. Um, I love clematis. Clematis is a vining flower, so it's definitely something that's airy and has really gorgeous movement. And this has almost like a, it almost looks like a little tuft of hair. It's interesting looking. Um, and this is great for ball texture. So I'm just gonna use this piece to elongate my ends of my design even farther. So just like the dahlias, this is gonna kind of bounce and fly away. So really kicking up the ends. It's always great when you're trying to do a garden design to reserve a couple of stems for the end that you know you can allow be kind of floaty and playful. Because especially as you're just starting out with garden design, it can feel a little bit weird to be so loosey-goosey. Um, and you can, without, uh, you can very easily make something more compact than you set out to. So saving a couple of ingredients for the end that can be a little bit more playful is super helpful. Um, and our last ingredient is our scabiosa pod, which is great for texture again. Um, I'm just gonna allow these to really poke out of my design as well. So that is everything in the design. I'm going to kind of clear off my table and allow you to see this up against the white wall. And I'll move the camera around um, so you can see it from a couple of different angles. But this is our completed, beautiful garden style arrangement. So we've got a really beautiful oblong shape. We've got some pieces that are flying away, which is really pretty and fun. Um, and that's the finished product. So for care for your arrangement, just like all of your other Helen Olivia designs, we recommend keeping your flowers out of really direct sunlight, um, keeping them out of heat, and giving fresh water um, at least once a day. So all of your stems, even the shorter ones, are drinking really well. Um, and some flowers will have just a shorter um, life expectancy. So for example, example, your dahlias may bite it after you know, four or five days. Just peel those out um, and continue to enjoy the flowers that are a little bit longer lasting. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to message us or comment and we'll get right back to you. Um, we have tons of fall classes and winter classes lined up, so jump over to the website if you're interested in taking another class. Um, I will be teaching, I'm trying to think of my next one, I think it's probably Thanksgiving Centerpiece, so hopefully I will see some of you there. I hope you enjoy your beautiful flowers and we'll see you soon. Thanks.